Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into Capcom's recently released Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster and see how it stacks up to the original 2006 classic. However, for the sake of consistency between versions shown today, I will not be using the original Xbox 360 release of the game, and have opted to instead use the 2016 re-release available on Steam, PS4, and Xbox One, which features support for higher resolutions, higher frame rates, and other small tweaks to the gameplay. For both titles shown today, I'll be playing and recording footage on the PC, with the settings cranked up to their highest available levels at a native 4K resolution. And while I did capture some of the gameplay footage of the newly released Deluxe Remaster with DLSS enabled, the actual side-by-side -side comparisons shown today will have the upscaling solutions disabled in order to ensure that we're getting a native 4K image for analysis. So let's kick this comparison off by first taking a look at the character models, starting with the game's lead protagonist, Frank West. Right out of the gate, Capcom's deluxe remastered vision of Frank West is remarkably different from his original 2006 debut. With the remaster, Capcom totally revamped Frank's facial features, giving him a less broad chin, a receding hairline, light wrinkles and crow's feet, and elongating his nose slightly to better complement his larger forehead. The eyebrows are also furrowed more, giving him a more aggressive resting face. In addition to changes made to the model geometry and poly count, the character artists have also incorporated plenty of 4K texture work as well, along with more advanced lighting and shading techniques, including subsurface scattering and improved specular lighting to help the pressed wrinkles of his leather jacket stand out better when passing through various light sources in the environment. Another big change that impacts both Frank and the game as a whole is the reworked color grading that more accurately portrays the dark black of his leather jacket and his hair, whereas those same features appeared brown before. On top of these surface level changes, the team at Capcom Japan have also reworked Frank's animations, building off the original skeletal animations with small flourishes to help things like his watch checking and camera inspection when idle look even more convincing. The main walk and run cycles have also been redone, helping Frank appear a little bit more human as he wanders the Willamette Mall, as opposed to before where his hunched over posture and weird, heavy, left to right walking rhythm made General Traversal look unnatural. Alongside this, Frank's base movement speed is also slightly faster than before, and crowds of zombies no longer disable the ability to walk slowly, giving players a little bit more freedom of movement in those situations. During cinematics, the improvements made are even more obvious, as the developers have taken every character model and totally overhauled their facial animations, while also updating textures, shaders, poly counts, and hair cards, in addition to a few other smaller details like new eyelids and eyebrows that do a much better job of telegraphing various emotions. This woman at the beginning, for example, now has a new animation for her brows that makes her look genuinely worried as opposed to before where only her lower eyelids were used to convey this emotion. This man within the same cutscene, on the other hand, previously didn't have any eyelids at all, making him appear absolutely terrifying in the original game, not to mention his eyeballs are constantly centered directly, giving him this crazy dead stare when he yells at Frank. Then of course, we have the Walking Dead themselves. Like the human characters, the zombies have been given some much needed improvements including higher poly counts, upgraded texture work, improved material for their clothing and skin, and hair cards, replacing the previous baked hair texture. Because of the redesigned lighting and color grading, you will find that zombies have a much darker appearance in general, with some of those more gross details being somewhat obscured, whereas they stood out very prominently before. But this is in no way an attempt to censor the game's violence, as Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster does feature much more blood and dismemberment than the original game. What I did find a bit disappointing in regards to the zombies though, is in how they function within the game world itself. While the core mechanics are more or less the same between the original and this remaster, veteran players will find that the zombies in the remaster are a little bit less aggressive on average, 
with a much lower detection radius than in the past. This makes for a much less hectic experience as you explore the mall, and can result in smaller dynamic hordes on average, even if the system is more than capable of handling just as many zombies if not more. To be clear, there are more zombies on screen in the remaster, but you won't be constantly swarmed by them. If you find a safe corner off to the side that seems empty, chances are it'll stay empty. Whereas before, you'd find groups of zombies that would gradually close in on your location from all angles. Distant zombies on the other hand, have been increased in density, as have some of the ambient zombies located outside of the playable area. Next up, let's talk environments. Dead Rising games are all about their environments, as the entire experience revolves around using those spaces to defeat swarms of Romero-esque zombies. And the Willamette Mall featured in the original Dead Rising stands as one of the series' best sandboxes, with lots of great variety, smart item placement, and plenty of great secrets to discover. Thankfully, for fans looking to return to their favorite zombie-filled mall, the Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster features a near-identical recreation of this playspace, with every storefront, kiosk, and save point bathroom exactly where you remember it being. That being said, at first glance, it may not be recognizable, as Capcom's level designers have given these locations some massive visual enhancements, filling them to the brim with appropriate decor that not only enhances the look of the scene, but adds to the intended art style of those spaces. The Welcome Plaza, for example, still features the same central rotunda, with a large clock and bee statue welcoming players into the world. But the clock itself is now fully animated, with working gears alongside the clock hands. New details like a welcome sign, along with hanging ornaments have also been added in, along with a massive assortment of decorative ambient lighting along the ceiling windows and upper balconies. A lot more vegetation has also been added in to help break up the repetitive emptiness of the area, along with decorative flags, benches, mall directories, and other props that help to sell the illusion more effectively. What's not been added, at least based on the several hours that I've played of both titles this weekend, are any new usable items on the ground. As players may already know, Dead Rising's unique combat systems allow players to pick up nearly everything that they find in the environment, and then use them as weapons to fight the zombies. This means assets in the original game that would appear decorative could also be used as a deadly potential weapon. To maintain the number of available weapons and preserve that balance of gameplay, Capcom has opted to not add to this number, ensuring every item is where it should be and any new decorations are just that, and can't be used as weapons. For the most part, this doesn't seem to have hurt the readability of the gameplay, as I never found myself mistaking a decorative bench for a usable one, though it is something that less experienced players may encounter at times. As far as the other environments go, players can expect to see all the same great improvements regardless of where they decide to visit with tons of decorative props added to really break up the otherwise bland and soulless looking corners of the map. I especially love the updates to the central leisure park area, as the flat green space filled with ugly baked shadows and low res grass textures is now much more properly realized, with thousands of grass cards adding much needed depth to the field, along with improvements made to all the trees and shrubs and even enhanced geometry for the rocks that line this pond. All the textures in the game appear to be built for higher res displays and look fantastic, enhanced further by some great ambient occlusion to really sell a level of depth never before seen in Willamette Mall. Which brings us to our next topic, the lighting. The lighting in Dead Rising Deluxe is one of its best changes. Gone are the obvious baked lighting phases used before, replaced by a much more advanced dynamic lighting system, with real-time shadows for most environmental assets adding an entirely new look and feel to each playable space. Volumetric light will also pour in through windows, adding a great atmospheric layer to the cavernous corridors of the mall, giving it an even larger look and feel. The subtle bloom applied to some of the game's lighting effects also adds a great modern look to each scene, without ever overdoing it or being distracting, bringing it more in line with later entries in the series. 
Capcom even threw in some new reflective properties into the game world, mainly screen space reflections that do a much better job of reflecting larger spaces than the old cube maps used before. There's even a bunch of new point lights added throughout the game that cast direct shadows from the player and other objects, making every light source feel more real than the clearly baked lighting they used before. The only thing the original arguably does better when it comes to lighting are these smaller mirrors. In the original game, Capcom used the old planar reflection technique, effectively duplicating a less detailed copy of the immediate area into the mirror and reversing it, allowing for a somewhat realistic looking reflection. For the most part, it holds up pretty well, and has enough detail in that reflected image to not be too obvious. But the deluxe remaster replaces some of these smaller mirrors with what look to be basic cube maps, with only the large mirrors in places like the bathrooms still using the planar reflections. Though aside from those few mirrors, a bulk of the reflective surfaces in Dead Rising Deluxe handle screen space reflections just fine, and add a great deal to the look and feel of each area. As mentioned previously, shadows are now more dynamic in the remaster, with the constantly updating lighting effects causing a shift in the angle of the environmental shadows at all times. This greatly changes the general appearance of every space, as some areas that were previously cast in a permanent bright baked light may occasionally be cast in partial shadow now, hiding some of the detail that may have been visible before. Aesthetically, it does change the mood of certain scenes, especially some of the psychopath encounters that now have a more appropriate, horror-oriented tone. Other miscellaneous effects worth mentioning include improved fire alpha effects, seen here in static props like fire barrels, improved explosive effects, higher quality smoke particles, and more fluid water simulation that are coupled with some interesting glowing caustics that give water an almost electrical look at times. There's also dynamic vegetation in some of the planters, allowing certain plants and flowers to bend out of the way as Frank runs through them. Next, let's take a quick look at some of the biggest changes made to the gameplay systems, starting with the rework to the gunplay. The original Dead Rising either forced players to shoot their gun wildly in front of them as they ran, or aim with precision, but stand still while doing so. The Deluxe Remaster finally changes this outdated system, adding in a new aim movement control option for players more used to the method found in most shooter games today. However, to maintain at least some of the challenge, the remaster does still lock the player in place once they start firing their weapon, leaving them exposed to zombies and incoming gunfire whenever they're actively engaged. Even still, this update makes Dead Rising 1 feel significantly easier, as players can much more easily peek out from corners to fire at challenging psychopath bosses, with little to no threat of being hit themselves. This, coupled with the lower detection range for standard zombies that I mentioned earlier, makes the Deluxe Remaster a bit easier of a game in general. And what's more, there's even a handy new automated checkpoint system that will reload the player at the start of the area that they just died in, rather than forcing them to respawn from the last bathroom that they saved at. Another big change to the remaster is the update made to the Survivor AI. Now, don't get me wrong, these AI are still as dumb as they come, and will get stuck all the time. But assuming they're following correctly, and they don't encounter anything too complex to get around, they should follow a bit more reliably than they ever did before. Capcom even added a staircase up to the vent platform, avoiding the need to awkwardly wait for NPCs to climb the ledge in order to safely rescue them. For players big into Dead Rising's unique camera system, the remaster offers a ton of additions to this mechanic, including new tilt options, filters, a flash module, brightness sliders, and a requirement to focus the shot with the autofocus button. Finally, let's wrap up with a brief sound comparison. Which game do you feel has the superior audio quality and design?
Probably just a sprain. I've got to help Brad, or he's done for. All right, fine. Give me your gun. Come on. I'm the reason you just got hurt. Let me help. No, I can't let a civilian do that. That's against regulations. Yeah, well, I don't think they had zombie-infested malls in mind when they wrote those regulations, kid. You know how to use this? Kinda. I've covered wars, you know. Brad was attacked. I located him on the monitor. It, it's probably just a sprain. I've got to help Brad. Or he's done for. All right, fine. Give me your gun. Come on. I'm the reason you just got hurt. Let me help. No, I can't let a civilian do that. That's against regulations. Yeah, well, I don't think they had zombie-infested malls in mind when they wrote those regulations, kid. You know how to use this? Kinda. I've covered wars, you know. And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster is an absolute joy to play through. Having played the original several times, along with its many sequels, the original Dead Rising is a remarkably unique experience, blending the classic Romero-style zombies with the sandbox freedom of a game like Grand Theft Auto, all layered over top of an intense time management metagame. It's a ridiculous game, and one that shouldn't be taken too seriously, but one that has always deserved to be given this type of upgrade, especially considering its old mid-2000s visuals haven't aged particularly well. There are certainly changes longtime fans will disagree with, including the change to the lead voice actors, the change to certain gameplay balancing, and maybe even the reduction of the overall difficulty in general. But there's no question that Dead Rising has never looked better, and for newcomers to the series, this is a great place to start. But what do you guys think? Are you enjoying Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster? Or do you still feel Capcom's original is the better option? Let me know in the comment section. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more content like this posted every week. <laughs>